7th of November 2017 is the 100th anniversary of the greatest single event in human history. I refer, of course, to the Bolshevik Revolution that took place exactly 100 years ago today. And to celebrate this event, of course, we celebrate it in a positive sense, our enemies, the defenders of the capitalist system and all the other enemies of socialism, are producing a torrent of misinformation, of slander, of defamation, of calumnies of this great event in history. One of the most common repeated slanders goes something like this. Of course, you know, it wasn't really a revolution at all. It was really a coup d'etat, a coup organized by a tiny, tightly disciplined group of conspirators led by Lenin and Trotsky. Now, you see, I think even a child of six could immediately see the blatant falsehood of this uh, assertion. I once asked a chap who was quite a well-known uh, bourgeois historian, the product of Cambridge University, Orlando Figs. Uh, I asked him, I said, Orlando, in a debate, look, uh, if this is the case, please give me the recipe, please give me the magic formula, and I will take power in Britain uh, next Monday at nine o'clock in the morning. Of course, it's complete foolishness. How could a tiny group of conspirators lead uh, the working class millions of people in a country of 150 million to the seizure of power. Of course, it's a, a physical impossibility. And the truth of the matter is this. The Bolsheviks could have taken power, as a matter of fact, as early as July. As early as July, they had the majority, they had the decisive majority, <clears throat> at least in Petrograd, not just of the workers, not just of the factories, but also of the soldiers and the sailors. And in fact, during the July, July days, there was nothing to stop them taking power. That's an actual uh, fact, which is e can e easily demonstrated. Yes, the reason they did not take power, they couldn't take power, in, in, in that sense, was because they did not yet have a majority in the whole country, that is. They, they didn't have the uh, majority of the front, the army, they didn't have the majority in the backward provinces, and therefore, had they done this, then of course, the reactionaries and the, the provisional government would have organized, mobilized the more backward provinces, and Petrograd, Red Petrograd, would undoubtedly have been crushed. So in, in that sense, the, the, if that would have occurred, the Bolshevik Revolution would have, taken, would have been the same as the Paris Commune. A very heroic, but a very bloody and ultimately unsuccessful and tragic uh, episode. Lenin and Trotsky deliberately tried to restrain the, the workers and soldiers and sailors in July precisely because they knew they didn't have a majority. And that was the task. The task facing the Bolsheviks was not at that stage to take power at all. It was to conquer the working class, not to conquer power, but to conquer the working class, to win over the majority of the workers in the Soviets, who at that stage were still under the uh, spell, if you like, under the, 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 the illusion, had illusions in the reformist parties, the, the Mensheviks and the SRs, the social revolutionaries. And it took experience. Of course, the workers in general don't learn from books, not because they're ignorant, but, but because of the conditions of life. But they learn from the greatest book of all, the book of experience. As Lenin put it, quoting a, an old Russian proverb, life teaches, life teaches, and li life taught the workers a lot of lessons, lot, a lot of lessons. The Kornilov uh, revolt, which we dealt with in the last, um, in the last uh, discussion, the Kornilov uh, adventure showed the threat that was facing the revolution if the workers didn't take power. Kornilov was defeated by the joint efforts, the uh, movement of the workers, particularly the United Front. That was a very important element. Despite the fact, you see here the flexibility of Lenin's tactics. Despite the fact that the, the provisional government, the, the, that is to say, basically the Mensheviks and the SRs, the reformists, uh, 
had moved against the Bolshevik party, had smashed uh, the, the Pravda's printing press, had driven the Bolsheviks underground, had arrested Zinoviev and Trotsky who were uh, in, in prison at that time, and Lenin was forced to, to seek uh, refuge in Finland uh, where he was underground. Right up until the seizure of power in November he remained underground, as a matter of fact. Despite all these facts, Lenin and Trotsky immediately offered a united front to these very reformist parties, to the Mensheviks and to the SRs, in order to combat the common uh, enemy, that's to say uh, Kornilov, and the uh, reactionary fascist elements actually. Uh, uh, this was decisive. It was decisive, first of all, <clears throat> in defeating Kornilov, in defeating the enemy. They were defeated decisively by uh, the beginning of September. But it was also decisive in another sense that it served to convince the masses, the workers, of the uselessness of the reformists, of the Mensheviks and, and SRs, and all the lies which they'd been saying about the Bolsheviks, that they were German agents, that they were counter-revolutionaries, of course, were exposed in practice, in action, through this flexible tactic of the United Front. With the following result, in the weeks following the defeat of uh, Kornilov, in the two months following the defeat of the uh, counter-revolution, throughout the months of September and October, there were elections in the Soviets. The Soviets, uh, I insist and I stress, were the only genuine, legitimate mass democratic organizations in Russia representing the mass of the people. There were elections. In these elections, in Soviet after Soviet after Soviet, the Bolsheviks won in democratic elections. The workers and soldiers and peasants decisively rejected the Mensheviks and the SS. Orlando Figs, who's no friend of the Bolsheviks, had to admit in his book that the Mensheviks by this time were completely destroyed. They were completely wrecked, not, practically non-existent in Petrograd at that time. And Soviet after Soviet was passing to the side of the Bolsheviks. And it was only at this stage that the question, of course, uh, the question of power was posed. Now it is true that there was uh, some, dis naturally, there was a lot of discussions in the ranks of the, the party about the timing of the insurrection, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, and so on. A section of the Bolshevik lead leaders actually were opposed to the insurrection. They, they got cold feet to be a little bit unkind. People like Kamenev and Zinoviev uh, were, were opposed, they were afraid. People like Gorky, who played a, a lamentable role, he was a great writer, he didn't understand much about politics if we were to tell the truth, were terrified at the prospect of taking power. Under the pressure, the colossal pressure of bourgeois public opinion, of attacks, of an hysterical campaign in the press, the usual lies about German agents and so on, that Lenin was a German agent. The truth of the, the, the matter is precisely the opposite. By the way, I noticed that they still repeat this. They, these wretched bourgeois lying uh, pernicious, uh, poisonous, so-called historians are still trotting out this, this, this lie, this atrocious, stupid lie that Lenin was a German agent. What's the truth? The truth of the matter is precisely the opposite. It was the bourgeois that were pro-German. Oh yes. It was Kornilov that surrendered Riga to the Germans, to the tender mercies of the German army. And, and, and the others, uh, Kerensky, the Mensheviks and SRs, were all in favor of this. Oh yes. And the bourgeois in particular. All these nice bourgeois ladies and gentlemen showing off their fancy dress on the Nevsky pr Prospect were screaming for, for, for the Germans to invade and to conquer uh, Petrograd. Oh yes, to teach the Reds a lesson, to teach the workers a lesson. Let the Germans come. That was the argument. It was repeated constantly in the bourgeois press. So that's a complete lie. It's the opposite of the truth. It was the, the, the bourgeois that were, were pro-Germans, not Lenin at all. But there was a discussion in the party that was a sharp, it is natural, given such a serious decision as that, the seizure of power, given also the, the enormous pressure of bourgeois public opinion and propaganda, that there were uh, the differences, sharp differences of opinion. And Lenin was very concerned. Lenin, don't forget, he was in Finland. He was far away from the scene of action. And therefore he was seriously worried that the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party might make a mistake, might miss the opportunity. You see, insurrection is an art. 
uh, Trotsky explains this, I think he was quoting another uh, revolutionary in the past. Insurrection is an art, and therefore the timing of the insurrection is, is not an unimportant question. It's a tactical question, if you like, but it's a fundamental tactical question. And Lenin was demanding, in a whole series of letters, he was demanding, and he says, look, the time to take power is now. He was talking about September or October at the, at the latest. But you see, Trotsky had a slight difference, a slight difference of opinion with, with Lenin, not on, the, not on the essence of the matter, because he also was in favor of, ta of taking power. It, uh, it go goes without saying. But the question was that, that at this stage there, there was, uh, there was the, uh, the calling of the Second Congress of Soviets, the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Now, you see, it might seem a strange thing to say, but the question of legality in a revolution is also quite important, in the sense that the, the workers and the peasants and the masses, the, uh, the politically untutored masses, if you like, because it isn't just the activists or the advanced elements that take power, it must be the masses, of course, that uh, participate in, the, or at least support, and have a favorable attitude towards this, the, the, uh, the seizure of power, they must be convinced that, that it is necessary to do so that it is justified, that it is legal, if you like. And of course, the main point about legality is if you're attacked. If you're attacked, you have the right to defend yourself. In any war, by the way, in a normal war, that's always the case, that you must put the blame on the other side. Uh, you must appear to be the, uh, the injured party, and you must uh, use that in order to, to, to whip up public support. Well, this was the same thing. Trotsky argued that they should wait until the, the Congress of Soviet had, w was convened, because he was confident, they were, everybody was confident, the Bolsheviks were going to win a crushing majority, a democratic majority at the, at the Congress of the workers and soldiers and so on. Uh, I repeat that in, throughout September and October there, there was a, a, a colossal swing of public opinion, if you like, in the working class and the peasantry and the soldiers in favor of the Bolsheviks. The soldiers had had enough. They'd had enough of, 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 of months of, of fighting in the, in, the, in the mud and the cold and the dirt and the, of the trenches. They wanted an end to the war. The, 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 the masses wanted bread. The women in particular wanted bread to feed their families. The peasants wanted the land. None of these things had been conceded by the provisional government. It's an actual fact. Provisional government, the bourgeoisie, if you like, revealed its complete bankruptcy in, in, the, in, those, in that nine-month uh, period. Which is why the Bolsheviks could succeed on the basis of the slogans peace, bread, and land, oh yes, and all power to the Soviets. So that was the only thing that could grant peace, bread, and land. It's an actual uh, fact. And therefore there was a swing. In, in the peasants there was a swing even. Peasantry uh, uh, were solidly supporting the Social Democrats right up to just before the insurrection, when, the so when such was the pressure of the peasants who were fed up with waiting for the land. Where, where's the land? Where's the agrarian reform? Doesn't exist. That, of course, the, this party split. The SR party split, and you had the formation of the left SRs, who gradually came closer to the Bolsheviks. They vacillated, but ultimately they came down in favor of the transfer of power to the Soviets. So that everything was building up. The whole mood of the masses was building up in the direction of the seizure of power. But Trotsky insisted, and he was right on this question, that tactically speaking, it was necessary to wait until the Congress had met, such that the Congress itself could legitimate this uh, seizure of power. Now, actually, a lot of nonsense is talked about, <coughs> about this event, um, which actually was a bloodless uh, revolution. Uh, that's not generally understood. The October Revolution, my friends, I, I repeat, was a fairly bloodless e event. Even Orlando Figgs, I think it was a slip of the pen on his part, you know, because he likes to portray Lenin and Trotsky as bloodthirsty monsters, but even he admitted in his book he compared the insurrection to a police operation. Well, that says it all, doesn't it, you know? Uh, it was a police operation because there was no resistance. It just collapsed. Nobody in the moment of truth was prepared to defend. Uh, the provisional government was just sitting in, uh, theoretically they had the power, they were sitting in the, winter, the Tsar's Winter Palace. Theoretically, on paper, they were the government, but they'd lost all support. 
the masses uh, massively supported the uh, the Soviets, and the Soviets now came out crushingly in favour of the Bolsheviks. In the Congress itself, of course, uh, Dan and other uh, Mensheviks made speeches, hysterical, including Martov, by the way. Martov was not the worst of them, he was a left Menshevik, an honest chap, but, but soft, vacillating, and therefore played a pernicious uh, role, a left reformist, if you like. They all gave hysterical speeches denouncing the Bolsheviks, look, you're seizing power. It's true that on, on the night of the 6th already they began to, to uh, armed units began to occupy uh, the key points, the telegraph and other uh, key points of, of, of state power. And ultimately, of course, they, there was the storming of the Winter Palace. Now, among the many legends about the Winter Palace, this is a, quite an amusing uh, incident, which proves precisely that the revolution was, uh, was a bloodless, the, the insurrection was a bloodless event. Ten years after the uh, after the Russian Revolution, after the October Revolution, in 1927, the great Soviet film director Sergei Eisenstein, I think he's probably the greatest director of all time, it's my opinion, but anyway, uh, Sergei Eisenstein uh, produced this film called October that some of you might uh, know. If you don't, you should take the trouble to see it. And during this classic this classic of cinema, this film, there's a famous incident, a famous episode, which is the, the um, storming of the Winter Palace. Now, as cinema, this is very effective stuff. It's very dramatic. You see workers and soldiers and sailors storming the Winter Palace, climbing up the, the gates, throwing bombs, shooting uh, rifles and so on. Yes, <clears throat> it's marvelous. As, cin as cinema, of course, it's uh, very powerful stuff. Unfortunately, as history, it's not quite accurate. You see, more people lost their lives shooting this scene in uh, Eisenstein's film than actually died during the seizure of the Winter Palace. Nobody was killed during the seizure of the Winter Palace. Unfortunately, during the shooting of the film, there was an accident, which is not surprising if you see all these terrible explosions and so on, and I think some people lost their lives in an accident. Yeah, but nobody was killed in the siege of the Winter Palace because they surrendered. There was no serious, uh, a little bit of resistance, not very much. In the film you see the, the cruiser Aurora, you, still, you can still see that ship uh, anchored in uh, St. Petersburg, if you like, uh, shooting artillery guns, cannons against uh, the Winter Palace. It's true they did. Yes, but they were firing blanks, because the Bolsheviks didn't want to damage an historical building. Anyway, I think I've said enough on that s score. The actual insurrection was a, was a peaceful affair. Be for what reason? Now, this is the crucial point to understand. The reason why the October Revolution was a relatively bloodless affair, at least in, in, in Petrograd, was because it, for the nine months previous to this, the Bolshevik party, through patient work, explanation, through the application, as I said, of the United Front uh, tactic, through agitation and propaganda, in other words, f f by political means, they democratically won over the majority of the workers, the, the soldiers, and even the peasants, by that time, were supporting them, were supporting the insurrection. For that reason, nine-tenths of the task of the armed insurrection was achieved previous to the armed insurrection by political means. Actually, in an article written shortly, shortly after the revolution, even Stalin admitted that the, the Communist Trotsky was responsible for winning over the Petrograd garrison. There's no question about this. So that the, the October Revolution, far from being as it is described by, by our enemies, as uh, uh, a, a coup organized by tiny conspiratorial minority. On the contrary, on the contrary, the October Revolution of 1917, friends and comrades, was actually the most democratic and the most popular revolution in history. If you want a description of that, but apart from the best book, of course, is Trotsky's... Um, marvelous uh, three-volume history of the Russian Revolution. But if you wanted to read something shorter and a marvelous piece of, of revolutionary literature, then read this famous book by John Reed, the American socialist, who's actually buried in the Kremlin walls. He's one of two. The other one was Big Bill Haywood.
two American socialists buried in the Kremlin walls because of their role in the revolution. John Reed wrote a marvellous little book called Ten Days That Shook the World. Lenin wrote an introduction to this book in which he says that Comrade Reed has written a, a most uh, truthful account of uh, the October Revolution, and that's a fact. And what comes across loud and clear from every page, every paragraph, every line of John Reed's marvellous little uh, masterpiece is precisely the participation of the masses, the democratic and popular and mass character of the Russian Revolution, a great event indeed. Years ago when I was in uh, Russia, this was in the Soviet Union in 1970, I, I met an old lady, an old woman who'd been a, a Bolshevik, who'd been participated in the revolution in 1970s. I think she was a school teacher in the Volga area. And uh, she'd spent 14 years in one of Stalin's terrible uh, forced labor camps. She didn't want to talk about that. She never would speak about that, that terrible experience. But I, want, I once asked her, I said, well, what was it like? What was the Russian Revolution like? I'll never forget the expression on that woman's face. You know, old and wrinkled and uh, worn out as she was. Her face lit up. It lit up. And she said to me in Russian, she said, you don't know what this, that was like. You can't imagine what that was like. She said, Kakoi Padyom, which in Russian, it means like a kind of spiritual uplift. Such an uplift of the people, see, you couldn't imagine it. And then the expression on her face changed and she said, not like now, which I could understand in the Russia of, of Brezhnev. But no, my friends, don't pay any attention to this uh, terrible distortion which is put out by the enemies of the October Revolution, the enemies of socialism, the enemies of the working class. This was the greatest act of mass social emancipation in history, comparable only to the great French Revolution of the 18th century, about which again a lot of nonsense is talked. But you know, the great English poet uh, Wordsworth, William Wordsworth, who, who, who as a young man went to France and experienced the revolution at first hand, he wrote the following line, which perhaps is, is a suitable uh, description of the Russian Revolution also. In his great work, The Prelude, he wrote, Bliss t'was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Commons, that is the reality of the Russian Revolution. And that is the great, marvellous historical emancipation which today we pay tribute to and pledge ourselves to carry out the same revolution, the same socialist revolution in our own countries and on a world scale.